Hi, thanks for tuning in to The Working Musician. This is Dreis Organica. This episode was brought to you by a little doers and a lot of Paps Blue Ribbon. Today I'm going to talk about songwriting and building on the shoulders of giants. So the other day I was writing a song and uh, it didn't take too long before I kind of realized, hey, this song kind of reminds me of a train, you know, and being a native Texan, it's not too unheard of to hear, you know, train themes and uh, country music in particular. So I was just like, okay, this is cool. You know, I'm going to do my own little rendition of a, of a train song. So I started working on a track that as of right now is still has the working title of the train song. And, uh, you know, so I worked through the guitar line, you know, kind of got that figured out to where I had a, a, a structure for, for, uh, verse chorus bridge core that kind of thing and uh so i started writing some some lyrics to go over it and uh i got to a pretty good point where like obviously i hadn't written figured out exactly what the words would be all the specifics but i figured i'm at a good point where i need to go ahead and start tracking it because lord knows you never know when the next time i'll have a chance to sit down with a guitar and work on this again and the biggest mistake i've ever made is uh not recording something and then you know a month later when i finally get another chance to start messing with it again i can't remember what i'm playing and then by the time i get it picked back out it's another month before i sit down on it again so it's like okay i just moved my studio into a new room i've got a a new recording booth let me go ahead and try it all out and uh so after after i got done recording the guitars and the, and the vocals and the bass and all that kind of stuff. Of course, I'm just tracking this to a simple drum loop. And, uh, you know, I was listening back to what I'd done and just thinking to myself, okay, what do I need to do to kind of get this to the next level? Because, I mean, it sounds okay, you know, it's fine, but eh, there's definitely more things I need to do. So I, I, I toggled around with, okay, do I need to add more gu- guitar parts? And the more I listened to it, I just couldn't th- even think of anything that I felt would really benefit the music by adding another guitar. Well, obviously the guitars are important. It's not really anything I felt like really needed to be highlighted, showcased, or you know, overemphasized with more layers or you know, leads or anything like that. Usually it's pretty, the obvious thing to do is just add a lead guitar part, but this really... This was the kind of song I didn't think really called for it. So I, I started looking into the vocals. I'm like, what can I do to make this really shine? And uh, very quickly, I was, it, it, just, it just was obvious, you know, this is what I need to do. This, is, this would sound great if I added this or that. And I, before you know it, I'm just adding a, a vocals here, there, double t- tracking, doing all kinds of things. And once you get started, it becomes kind of addicting. It's like, oh, wow, I can really... S- once I hear it back and start singing along, there are so many things I can do. So once I kind of dwindled it down to things, I, I, you know, here I'm revisiting it roughly a month later and I'm thinking, you know what, this would be a great segment for my show because, uh, you know, songwriting in the pre-production phase, especially, which I am super huge on. I don't, I think I could devote this entire show to just pre-production and, and have a happy 20 year reign doing a weekly episodes on just pre-production. So at the risk of not going too, too far into that, I realized, uh, you know, there's some things that I think a lot of people are missing out as far as making their album sound more professional just by their song arrangement and how they, how they do things and how they think about how to fit different parts into other parts of the song. And I thought this was a pretty good example of, uh, what can be done. So what I'm going to do is just play it start to finish, uh, just the meat and potatoes. All there is to it is this is just a drum loop, uh, some, uh, an acoustic guitar line, a bass line, and one vocal line. And, uh, after I go, go through it, I'll, uh, talk about some of the things I did vocally to enhance on it and how I, I borrowed little techniques and little styles from other musicians to kind of add to my own music. And while you could say, Oh, that's, that's stealing. I don't think of it that way because I didn't initially go, Hey, you know, I'm going to pull this 
I'm going to steal this from one artist. I just sort of did what seemed to make sense. And I kind of realized after the fact that really what I was doing was just using the music that influences me to make my own music, which is basically what everybody does. I mean, there's nothing that's 100% original. What's original is just how we do it. I mean, there is no chord that's never been played before, no rhythm that's never been done before. I mean, everything to some extent has been done. So, at the risk of sounding like a copycat, which I am totally not, and I think you'll it'll be self-evident in this song, I've never heard a song that sounds anything quite like this, but when I really start breaking it down after the fact, I begin to realize there's a few artists that I kind of borrowed some ideas from. Obviously, I made them my own, but I think um, it's just interesting to to kind of point out that we as songwriters and musicians really do uh, borrow so much from the, the music that influences us. And so I thought this was just a super cool example of how to pay respect to the artists that have influenced me and to kind of help give some people some ideas of things that they can do with their own music, just some ideas so, to help make their compositions a little bit more um, professional sounding because it's one thing to have a professional studio, but if the composition isn't professional, it just becomes very obvious as amateur. And I think one of the big things that we don't think about, uh, especially when we hit the studio is, is my composition really ready? And uh, obviously, as I play this back to you guys, you, you'll begin to realize this is not a commercial recording. This is simply pre-production. Every bit of it will be redone. But I think it kind of gets the uh, idea across of uh, just how important it is to do pre-production and the overall benefit. Because once you hear what I, the initial idea laid down on paper, so to speak, and then after working with it, especially with the vocal line, because at the end of the day, all I ended up doing was just adding some vocals uh, in different parts of the song. And it just really, I think, took it to the next level to where with was some work and actually knowing what I'm singing as I'm in the booth doing the vocal lines. Uh, it, it's not too hard to see where, where the potential that this song has with a little effort and just rehearsing. So I'm going to go ahead and play... The uh, meat and potato parts, and all that it will be, will just is just a drum loop that never changes. Guitars, bass, and a single vocal line, and then afterwards I'll play it the same track only with added vocal lines. And I think it'll be pretty obvious how much life is breathed into it just by adding the vo different vocal lines. And I'll kind of talk about some of the people I, that I realized I had borrowed some of these ideas from after uh, I'd recorded it. like the trees and I cannot believe that there is someone just like me and shoulder fought by upon my view and talked it up with me waiting for the weekend till I can see you this time again Again. 
used to be coming by It almost made my dark eyes cry Then there came a time Several weeks I hadn't seen you Came up to my door just right in out of the blue Waiting oh, for the weekend Till I can see you this time again Yeah, so there you go. I mean, obviously the vocals are in need, bad, bad need of rehearsal. I don't think I could even tell you what I said half the time, but, you know, went in there, tried to figure out <clears throat> a few ideas for the chorus, and then uh, just kind of hammer out and just practically ad-libbing most of the, the lyrics and everywhere else. But um <clears throat> I think it's pretty easy to see where just from there, like, Hey, this song has some potential, but there's clearly, it's not a finished idea. Now, obviously not in the recording, but more so in just the composition of the, the song. It's like the, the meat and potatoes, the nuts and bolts are there. Everything's there. It's just, there's something missing. And so, uh, let me show you what I did after I changed some of the vocals around. Streets, another brown in the sea. I saw you going past my drive. Then I started going to hide. Promise that it's not a sexual thing that I'm deprived of anything that I could not give without reasonable means. Just seems like there was something that was there in front of me. A darkness and a purity that circles like the trees And I cannot believe that there is someone just like me And found it for my for my view and talked it up with me Waiting for the weekend Till I can see you this time again
It almost made my dark eyes cry Then there came a time Several weeks I hadn't seen you Came up to my door just right And out of the blue Waiting for the weekend Till I can see you This time again Okay, I don't know what you guys think, but I think that is a huge improvement uh, as far as just the composition quality. Now you can go bash me all you want for the level of my vocals. Let's you know, but hey, this is a poorly rehearsed thing, and in all fairness, I, I've heard finished products whose whose vocals don't sound as good as that. So I was pretty happy. Uh, just a not not only just with the composition of the vocals, but just how uh, surprisingly decent it sounded considering that I was doing these with uh, my Audix i5, you old trusted, tried and true, old faithful here, inside of a closet. I mean, this thing has like zilch for acoustic treatment. So uh, I think it's really a testament of just how uh, appropriate a dynamic microphone can be in certain situations. Now, I may once I actually get around to tracking it, I'll probably use... Uh, a condenser microphone. I've got a few options, but uh, actually, I'm pretty excited. I, I just recently won from, uh, of all things, like I, this never happens to most people, myself including. I've never won anything, but I actually won a Lawton Audio Atlantis FC 387 FET condenser microphone. And this thing is just badass to a whole other level. And I, I mean, this thing holds its own against a, a, a U87, anything I've ever worked on. And I've worked on some very nice microphones in professional studios. And I think this thing holds its own with everything. Granted, it is a $1,600 microphone, but big shout outs to Pure Mix. Hey, when these guys have comp little competitions or little, uh, or not little, if these guys have a... Uh, some kind of a, a deal where you submit your email to win a prize, You'd be a fool to not enter because these guys legitimately have awesome manufacturers sending out awesome products to real people. I have no affiliation with these guys. I've never met them before. I don't know them. And uh, it was just super cool. So I'm, I'm a huge Pure Mix fan for life now because of this. But like I said, I will likely use a condenser microphone considering that's what I typically use for my vocals. Although instead of using the old trusted KSM 32 from sure I'll probably, and by probably, I mean, without a doubt, be using Lawton audio because there is just, while no, not disrespecting the KSM 32, it is a fantastic microphone, uh, regardless of its price. Uh, but in all honesty, the Lawton audio just plain sounds better, uh, on my vocals at the very least. So let's take a look at some of the things I, I did on this track. Um, uh, I don't know how obvious it is, but there's there's some double tracking going on there. Uh, well, hey, sure, I can do some double tracking, and it makes sense on some things. 
uh, it, it doesn't always make sense for every type of material. Mm-hmm. Something like this, it works. And something to think about is, sure, I can pull this off. And not to say I'm the greatest. But I, oh, I'm a very mediocre singer, in my opinion. But double tracking is a skill that takes a lot of practice to be able to do. And guys, I've been doing this for uh, a good 15 years of, of singing uh, in some way, shape, or form. So, yeah, at, at this point, I can generally double track things and it sounds okay. But there's a lot of times where I realize I am just trying to force it. And maybe if I were a true professional, I could ma- I could pull it off. But, you know, I, there's times where even I can't even pull it off. And I've been at this for quite a while. So... Don't feel bad if you struggle with double tracking vocals because uh, that's the stick case for basically everybody. But uh, there's some parts, where, uh, especially in the chorus, where I double track the vocals, just said, sang the exact same line uh, in the exact same way and just doubled it. There's also some parts where I added some uh, slight variations of in the chorus of what I was singing. Uh, and slight variations mostly just into the... Uh, uh, the pitch I was singing and a little bit uh, holding out certain words a little bit longer just to create some contrast and some sort of like delay uh, effects without using plugins. And it, it seemed to work. It's not something I actively thought about. It's just as you're singing along, it's like, hey, this this sounds good. I like this. You hear it back. Okay, it actually is good. Because uh, believe it or not, just because we have an idea doesn't mean it's actually the right thing to do. So this was not my first idea. It's probably my second or third, but it seemed to be okay. And once again, I'm talking about the choruses. Uh, did a few little variations, and uh, there was one I thought sounded kind of cool. Uh, in addition to the double track, but where you really start to notice the the most differences is in starting from the bridge all the way through the last chorus. And uh, I want to point out. That there are three artists in particular that after I got done tracking everything and was listening back, finished up my my rough mix, at the end it was just so obvious that hey, I am borrowing from some giants here. Uh, I'll, I'll start for with probably one of the more recent and lesser giants is uh, on some of the hey 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 things. I mean, in my opinion, that's a that's a compliment to. The Lumineers on their Ho Hey song, and they do these kind of that, that kind of stuff in a lot of their their kind of folk styled Americana albums work that they do. But uh, I'm a huge Lumineer fan, and I'll tell you guys something: there, if there is a CD out there to buy, the Lumineers, it is just sounds it just sounds wonderful. I mean, don't buy don't download the MP3, buy the CD. It sounds great. It is truly a work of art. And so, huge Lumineers fan from someone over here. And I'm not the kind of guy who usually likes new music, but the Lumineers definitely love it. That's an album I bought, and I don't buy that many albums, so that says something. But uh, definitely added a little bit of the, the hey, hey, hey onomatopoeia, so to speak. And I think it definitely helped add to the ambience of what a train station would kind of sound like. And then uh, during the bridge, it was just so obvious that that is something that I I was influenced from System of a Down. Uh, there's a few bands out there that have really influenced me. Tool would be one of them, A Perfect Circle, both Maynard projects. But uh, definitely a System of a Down is up there, just like Incubus is up there. But So that doesn't surprise me because System of a Down is a, is a band that I just really, really love. I love everything about it, and I've loved it for a long time. Um, so that didn't really surprise me. I tend to kind of go down that road a little bit more often than I even intend to. But listening to the 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 bridge, especially with the uh the little breakdown of the just the syncopated two chord back and forth guitar line and then the uh the the vocal line, it was just obvious that this is that's a system of a down, you know, tribute so to speak. And then uh as I started getting into the latter half of the the bridge and then into the the last chorus i was just like i didn't realize dave grohl from the foo fighters had just come in here and started tracking vocals i mean it was just like oh wow that is such a dave grohl foo fighters uh concept that that's being implemented here and i think it clearly works but and i don't i don't feel bad i don't feel like i owe him an apology 
But if anything, it's I think it's a it's a compliment to have respect because I while I I personally I like the Foo Fighters, I haven't bought any of their albums. I don't really feel I need to because uh. Actually, I take it back. I think I did buy one of their albums on cassette, which is long, long since been lost. But yeah, in all fairness, I did buy a Foo Fighters album. So I can say I have bought Foo Fighters in the past. But uh, Foo Fighters is one of those kind of mainstream bands that it's just hard not to like. They they really do have some pretty cool stuff out there. And I think they're a band that just, just stays relevant over time and just ke- keeps getting better and better which is a hard thing to do and very, very few people are able to stay relevant and much less get better over time. But uh, it was just as I was listening back, I'm like, wow, this is a, that is definitely a, uh, I'm definitely building on the, the, the shoulders of the Foo Fighters on, on that vocal line. And so it's just something to think about, you know, it's okay to, to borrow ideas, even if you realize you're doing it, it's okay. Now, obviously, if I were to be flat out ripping it off, that's another story. But if if you can hear your own, other people's work and it, your other inspiration from other people's work in your own, that's not a bad thing because guess what? Other people have inspired them, and we're just trying to build off each other and make better and better uh, music. And that's the that's the end game. But there's something I uh, I think I did in this song that. A lot of us can can do, and I think a lot of us have heard it done quite a few times. It's not an original idea, but it's one of those things I think a lot of people don't think to do, and that's just simply taking a part from a previous part of the song and implementing it into another part of the song. Like in the initial start of the song, it starts off in the chorus which isn't a completely original idea that's done fairly often. And the hey, hey, hey part, I implemented in the last chorus, right? So, I mean, that just one little thing. Hey, I didn't do it in the second chorus, but I brought it back for the third, right? And then as the the kind of Dave Grohl part, I'm going to let my light here shine, blah, blah, blah. You know, I brought brought it back again after I'd done it in the the, uh, bridge. I brought it back into the the third chorus. So here you've got parts from three different parts from songs coming together all at the end, you know? And if I were to have done that all the way through the song, it wouldn't have been very impactful. And uh, I've written a few songs where it's just like, I love the last chorus. The, the, the last 30 seconds of the song are by far the best. And I, I always think to myself, have I done a disservice to myself or to the listener by making them wait till the very end of the song for the most impactful part. And uh, it's probably not something you always want to do, but it's kind of a weird concept. Yeah, my favorite part of the song was the end. (laughs) Well, oh, thanks, jackass, you know. But no, and it's one of those things like, a good song should leave you in suspense until the end. Not to say that that's how every song should be done, but there's nothing wrong with saving the best for last and building little bit, little bit, build it hard, take it away, and then just bam, knock your socks off at the very end. And uh, it, it's one of those things where like, I'll find myself just putting it on loop, just like the last uh, chorus of some other artists or some stuff I do, and just wanting to listen to it over and over again. But you begin to realize without the first you know, verse or two in chorus, it's not the same. So just something just because you you don't have to do the same things over and over again from one chorus to the next from one verse to the next uh it, it's okay to take away part parts it's okay to strip stuff down it's okay to build upon ideas and and make the song more impactful from one chorus to the next uh the biggest thing to is just realize that hey look at what a lot of other professional artists out there are doing and realize that the stuff they're doing is not, it's not like it's a 100% original idea. So if you hear something that, that you think would sound cool in your own music that other people have done conceptually, don't be afraid to try it. If it works, do it. Obviously, you don't want to just flat out rip people off. But if you notice that, hey, somebody like the Foo Fighters have a tendency to take certain lines from their bridge and continue it into their third chorus, 
that's not like it's a completely original idea on their behalf, so what's wrong with doing it with your own music? If you happen to notice that a band like System of a Down has these bridges or breakdowns that kind of uh, kind of add just this sort of dissonance and kind of like this part that puts butterflies in your stomach to where the chorus comes in, it's just like, oh, thank God. You know, I love that bridge, but thank God that chorus came in to just kind of relieve that pressure. Uh, they're not the first people who have done that. You know what I mean? So th- that's a great tool. Realistically, look at what other people do. Look at like their transitions. Look at how they do things and realize that these are tools that you can implement in your own music. Just kind of like the Lumineers, adding those little like sound effects, the ho, hey. You know, obviously, if I would have done ho, hey, that would have been ridiculous. It wouldn't have made sense for the song. I wouldn't have been doing myself any favors by ripping them off, but adding a little, hey, 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 you know what I mean? I don't know if that's obvious that I'm, uh, that that's something I got from the Lumineers. Maybe it's not, but in my mind, knowing how big of a Lumineers fan I am, it's pretty obvious that that's something I got as a result of being such a huge Lumineers fan. So, don't be af- what I'm basically saying here, guys, is don't be afraid to pay tribute to the bands that you love and respect and implement some of their styles into your own music because, like it or not, if you're writing music, uh, you're basically borrowing from the ideas of giants uh, who stood there before you. So don't be afraid to experiment and always keep growing. Bye.